Welcome, Robert. Welcome to Belfast. Uh, you're very welcome. This event sold out in one day. Yeah. That is how popular you are in this city. Um, and this fantastic audience here have been sending in questions. Uh, so we're going to include some of their questions as we okay. go along. And if we have time at the end, obviously we can have some comments from you as well. And we're going to see some clips and we're going to enjoy this evening. Um, Robert, just to start off with, um, uh, I mean, we think of Glasgow as a big Belfast. Uh, do you think of <laughs> Belfast as a wee Glasgow? <laughs> Uh, anyway, first of all, can I just say thank you very much for this, by the way. That's uh, You're really amazing. Welcome. I'm really, 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 really touched and honoured to receive that. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> Maltese Falcon as well. Yeah, <laughs> you're people. very welcome. It's amazing. Um, in a way, yes, I guess it is. It's, uh, it's kind of like that. And whenever I'm here, it's, it feels like a home from home, that's for sure. Yeah. And I mean, there are many similarities. Uh, shipbuilding, of course. Yeah. Uh, hard men. <laughs> uh, even tougher women. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Celtic and Rangers. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of similarities. But when, I mean, when did you first come here? Like, when was your first kind of sense of Belfast have been? Uh, I, I can't even remember what. I'm so old. I can't remember what year it was. Now. It was a long time ago. Um, I did a theatre here. Uh, oh, you I did, did some, some touring over here. Uh, a couple of times with a couple of different theatre companies from Glasgow. And I toured around uh, all of Northern Ireland, in fact. And, uh, but particularly here in Belfast. So that would have probably been sometime in the late 80s. Wow. Yes. And what were the audiences like, say, compared to tonight? Smaller audience. than this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just the same as it was back home, you know. I mean, yeah. there's no, no, no difference really for me at all at that time. The, 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 kind of, the way the audiences were, the way they kind of reacted or related to the shows that we were doing. Um, so very, very similar. And of course, you made a few films in Ireland. You made The Mighty Celt um, here in Belfast. And then Angela's Ashes, of course. And yes. So what were those experiences like working here? Mighty Kilt was, uh, was, a, was a, a nice experience. Uh, Pierce Elliott, who, who directed that, was a lovely, lovely guy. And I, that was, um, I suppose I was, uh, um, I was able to go into more than the heart of Belfast, really, in that film. Um, and of course, there's, uh, the, 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 troubles and the troubles that you've had over here, you know, and, uh, long and varied. But uh, that was kind of, obviously, for my first time, I was kind of able to see that, you know, and be sort of um, in amongst that, in a way. Um, so that, that was, a, that was a, an incredible experience. Angela's Ashes is an entirely different type of thing. Most of it in actual fact sh shot in the South. Yeah. Um, but of course that was a different thing. And also I kind of look back into the past as well in, in, in Ireland. So two entirely different things there. And what about the accent, Robert? How hard is it to get the, even the Northern accent, do you think? You want me to do it now? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go on. I think the, 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 northern, the northern ones uh, is not, not, not so difficult really because it's, uh, we speak um, in Glasgow, it's Ul Ulster Scots it's called, yeah. it's actually what we all speak, all the Northern mm. Ireland people, we all speak that, so it's, it's, it's kind of easy to slide into that type of thing. And of, and of course in the south it's, it's a little bit more difficult, it's an entirely different accent really, but it's something much, much more gentle, a gentle kind of tone. But uh, I'm always at home when I'm playing you know, people from Ireland. You know, much as, 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 it's not easy, but um, when, when, you're, when you're speaking that way for a while, you, can, uh, you fall into it. Yeah. Well, Robert, this award obviously was for your outstanding work in cinema, which we will look at tonight. But we also salute your work off screen. You've done a lot of work for like charities around the world. You do a lot of work for kids in very difficult situations. Yeah. Uh, and we do salute you for that. Thank you. Um, but tell us about kind of growing up in Glasgow in the 60s, because here you are, you know, with this fantastic career that we're celebrating tonight. But I mean, you, what was it like kind of growing up at that time? Um, what was your kind of thought of what you may actually go on to be in life? Wow. Um, <laughs> well, probably the last thing I thought I was going to be was an actor, that's for sure. There was, there was no history of um, acting or, or, or theatre. I'd never been in a theatre when right. I was younger, not at all. Um, so the, the, the notion of it becoming an actor would have been alien to me at, at that time. Um, 
I, I can tell you, you know, when I was uh, most, this doesn't really tell anybody anything nowadays, but you know, my, my, my mother left when I was a wee boy. Uh, I was only three. And my father brought me up mm -hmm. uh, on his own. And um, he used to, that period from three year old to probably 10, he, we would go to the cinema three, four, five times a week. Wow. And, and back, back then, uh, you were able to, to go in to, to watch the movie and you could actually watch it all the way through again. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't even throw you. <laughs> so uh, our, our living conditions back then was dirt poor. So it was always cosier and warmer <laughs> in a cinema. So the, 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 this, this kind of world here, you know, this is what I kind of, I grew up in places like this, you know, and I, I, I kind of grew to love it. So that I was kind of, I suppose, attracted to it back then, but no notion really of being an actor. Mm. You know, maybe a notion of being a cowboy, that would have been <laughs> something. I don't know what I wanted to do. But uh, it wasn't really about, about acting. That came an awful lot later. And when did that come? Like, what, what was the thing or what was the moment where you kind of said, I could, I could be an actor? Genuinely, it's, uh, I, I don't know if it was any one sp specific thing that, that did it. Um, a friend of mine was, uh, was, was uh, getting involved in drama when I was probably around about uh, 18, 19, something like that. And uh, he, he, was, he was going to this, this place called the Glasgow Art Centre in Glasgow. And uh, this, is the, this is the truth. It's maybe not a very kind of PC thing to say, but you know, he said, look, there's a lot of good looking women here, so you should, you should go. <laughs> And he was right, you know, so I kind of went, went to this place and uh, there was, it was all filled with, with girls, you know, all girls that wanted to be actresses and stuff like that. Very few guys, so there was very little competition, which was great for me. <laughs> um, so I kind of sat there for, for about a, a maybe three or four months in this place. I used to go t t twice a week. And um, there was a woman there called Maggie Kinloch. I tell you, you know, without Maggie Kinloch, I'm, I'm not sitting here right now right. You know, at all. And she, she, she came up to me um, one of these nights and she said, uh, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, I don't know, I'm just with my pal. And she said, well, do you know what, you come up and join in? Because they were doing improvisational type mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, I was like, nah, no, no interested, you know? Uh, and she said, uh, well, you have to leave then. It's like, <laughs> just kind of harsh, but, but probably true. So it's kind of chippy back then. I went, well, fuck it, okay, you know. So I kind of <laughs> walked walk towards the door. And as I, as I go towards the door, she, she went, hey, 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 like that. I said, what? She said, well, you're just going to walk out. I said, well, you just told me to go. And she said, well, you know, you can either kind of, you can use that one way or the other. You can sort of take that as, you know, a challenge, or you can walk out the door. So it's the word challenge. I was remember saying that. <laughs> challenge, okay. I fancy a challenge. So I did. I mean, so, so I don't, it wasn't that particular night, but I came back again and again. I think it was the third or fourth time after that. I got up and, uh, and they were improvising. I can't even remember what it was, but it's improvising something or other. And uh, it, was, it was funny and, I, and I, I, I spoke and people laughed. They laughed. Mm. And it was like a drug. Mm. I was like, wow, I like this. This is good. And there was some kind of, um, some kind of acceptance for me in this, this arena for the first time. I've never told that story before, by the way. Well, we thank you for sharing it. We thank you for sharing it. And, and what was the reaction then when you said that you wanted to be an actor? Like, what was your dad's reaction to this? What was your kind of friend's reaction or whatever to this? Uh, my friend's reaction was like, it was, what are you talking about? You know, I mean, what, what, what do you mean? You know, it's, there, was, there was kind of no reaction. I just thought I was stupid or, you know, taking the piss or whatever. But my dad was great, you know, he was, uh, I mean, he was shocked as well because I was painting at the time, I was a painter and decorator at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what my father had done, that's what my grandfather had done, everybody had done that. So that's what I should do. Um, so w w w when, I, when I kind of I broke this, this to, my, to my father, he, he, he was, he said, okay, he said, um, all right, some of that, I'll back you up, whatever you want to do, you know. But I don't think he, he was entirely sure I can tell you this, this is a nice, this is a nice story. This is, this is years, cut to years and years and years and years and years and years later. At this point, I'd, I'd done Bond and all that, but at this point. And uh, <coughs> my dad said to me, one night he said, <laughs> he said, you're doing all right, sonny. <laughs> Things are going okay, you know. 
and um, I said, Aye. and he said, so um, things are fine, eh? I, was like, I knew he was something on his mind, and I said, oh, I think things are going to be okay. How? And he said, well, he said, look, and he went into this drawer, and he pulled out this book, and it was like a bank book. He said, when you, when you told me that you were going to become an actor, he said, I, I, he said, I wasn't too sure how that was going to go. He said, so I put a wee bit of money away for you. He says, just in case it wasn't going to work out, he says, so I'll get you a wee set of ladders and some brushes and stuff like that. <laughs> and he went like that, and he showed us this, and his cash, there was 300 quid, right? Wow. It was in this thing. Now, for my dad, that was a lot of money, you know, at the time. And he, he, so he showed me this, this, this 300 pound, I was like, fuck, you know. I said, damn on, you're going to spend that tomorrow. And he's going to spend it. So, that, so that's what my dad thought about it, but he, he had a wee contingency. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> just in case it wasn't going to work. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Um, <clears throat> well, we were very fortunate uh, last year, if anyone was here, to have Ken Loach on this stage. Uh, uh, and that was a great night for us. And I know he played a big part in your early career. Huge. Um, and uh, this is a question from the audience to do with Ken. So this is from another Ken, Ken McNeely, who says, first of all, thank you, Robert, for all your fantastic work portraying all kinds of characters over the years. And happy to have you back in Europe again. Um, are we still in Europe? Are we? OK, yes, no, we are. We are. Just, We're just about just. in Europe. Uh, but <coughs> excuse me. What he asks is, what are your memories of working on Riff Raff with Ken Loach, and would you agree that it's still a very relevant piece of work? Oh, I think it's definitely a relevant piece of work, there's no doubt. I think it's um, the, kind of the notion of the itinerant building worker, building site worker, is you know, still going to this very day. You see them all over, the, all over the place, you know. A lot of them coming from different parts of Europe as well. Stevie, the character I played, could be you know, Vlad no, or whatever, but it's, it's, these, these, guys, these guys exist for sure. But Ken was, um, th this, I, I, it was brand new to me really. I'd done a little bit of telly, I think, um, before Riff Raff. Riff Raff was my first, no, I'd been in a film or two, but it was small. Um, this was certainly the first lead part. And it, it, was, it was extraordinary really, you know, he, the way that he works is, is like no one else, no one, no one works like Ken Lodge because you, you don't, you, you don't, first thing is you don't get a script, which is odd, you know what I mean, in terms of most film, filmmaking. Um, you get a notion, you get an idea, you get an idea, you get a name, you get what he does, is what you get that. Um, and then the whole thing is kind of improvised or seemingly improvised from, from then on in. Of course, at, at the end of, at the, end of the, 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 the filming process, he will produce a script and go, bang, there you go. And you look at this thing and you go, and there's a lot of the stuff that you've said. And yeah, I don't want us to get, he's like a magic, you know, he's a magician. He's, he's a master in the most beautiful way, manipulator. To, he puts you in a situation where you can only really say the things that, are, that he wants you to say, almost, in a sense. It's a very difficult thing to explain unless you've been through that process. Even for actors, it's hard to understand. But you will, uh, for instance, right, very, very quickly, mm -hmm. You and I, in a scene, you know, we're in a cafe, right, or whatever it is, and say we're in this situation, so we go, bang, stop, you know. So I'll say, God, that water's a bit warm, you know, and you'll say, well, ask for some more, and blah, blah, blah. So we go on for about five minutes like this. Ken will come over, and he'll go, right, good, 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 good. What did you say about the water? So I says it was a bit warm, and you go, right, right, and away you go, <laughs> you think, right, I'll keep that. So you start next time, water's about one. And so it goes like this. Yes. So he'll come back in every couple of minutes and go, what did you say, what did you say, what did you say? So you go, right, I'll, I'll keep that. So it, it, it's sometimes a long process. We can, uh, the most takes I've done is maybe about 45, 46 wow. takes in a wow. scene. So it can wear you down, there's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. But through that, he just doesn't want to tell you to say it. He wants that to come for you. He wants you to find that truth. You know, because it is such a false thing that we do, and trying to kind of keep any kind of reality in it is very, very tough, very difficult. So Ken's way of doing that is to kind of grind you down in a corner that you can only really say, what well, was about one? What was about one? <laughs> um, well, that was 1991, and then you later worked with Ken again in 1996 on yeah. Carla's song, uh, where you played this Glaswegian bus driver who falls in love and then goes off to war in, yeah. in kind of Nicaragua. What was your experience working on Carla's song? 
I, lo I loved Carla's song for many, many different reasons. Of course, it was um, for, for those of you that don't know what the film's about, it's bus driver, a play, Glasgow bus driver, and he, uh, he, he meets a uh, Nicaraguan, um, almost refugee person in the streets of Glasgow, dancing in the streets of Glasgow. And he becomes kind of besotted by, by, by this girl and uh, he wants to kind of somehow look, look out for her, look after her and, and, and take her uh, and, and um, take him in, in, her into his life. The other, so half of the film's in Glasgow and the other half of the film's in, in Nicaragua. So uh, <laughs> Ken Lodge, he, he's, it's, it's all about surprises and tricks and stuff like that. First thing was for me, he, he phoned me up and he said, do you want to come and do this film? Yeah, you're a bus driver. Hang on. <laughs> like, Fucking better learn to drive a bus. <laughs> so I, I, that's the first thing that I did. Went and did this. So again, I mean, I managed to, managed to do that, learn to drive a bus, pass the test, did all that kind of thing. And then I found out, you know, of course, that when I passed it, they were all in Nicaragua filming at the time when I was there. There was like this eruption uh, took place in Nicaragua because if I, if I hadn't passed that test, the film was no more because Glasgow uh, Council had said there is no way we're letting an actor jump on a bus <laughs> unless he knows what he's actually doing. So all the stuff, if you ever see the film of me driving the streets, is all real and true. You know, well, this is great because we have a clip of you driving the bus. So, uh, so we're, gonna, we're going to see a clip um, from Carla's song uh, directed by Ken Loach and then another clip from Ravenous directed by Antonia Bird that we can talk about when we come back. Okay, so here, this is clip one. Thank you. The late, great Antonia Bird. Explain to us about her and, and what was so special about her. Antonia Bird, who directed Robinus there, um, she was a, a, a tremendous uh, influence on me. I did four films with Antonia. Um, the very first one, that I did probably is the, the best one to talk about, a film called Safe. Um, which is about homelessness uh, in, in London, the sort of cardboard city, stuff as it was down there in the, the 90s. And um, she had, uh, she'd seen, she'd seen Ruff Raff, you know, so she was, uh, of course, it's a thing when you work with people like Ken Loach, then you've got to work with Ken Loach type directors as well, you know, it's the great things, like circuit. So uh, she was kind of interested in, in working, working with me because of that. So this, this film, this character that was playing in Safe was an insane, insane kind of uh, guy. And he was, um, it was very, very difficult because she'd cast all and about me. Um, he was the leader of a, home, a pack of homeless, homeless kids, basically. And, uh, and all around about me, she'd cast like real homeless people stuff like that. And it was like, it's typical Antonia, you know, she's, mm. it's just it's a crazy kind of thing to attempt to do. Um, and it's very, very hard for, 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 for me to kind of get in the improvise the rehearsals, you should say, and, and the weeks, two, we had two weeks re to rehearse, which again, only Antonia would, would have mm. that. You don't get any, any rehearsal in the film, certainly not nowadays. Um, it was very, very difficult for me to control these kids, you know, because I was supposed to be their boss, their leader, but they were like, ah, fuck off, and they were like, running, <laughs> running all over me, you know. So I didn't know what to do uh, at all, you know, and uh, I remember saying to Antonio, I, just, I don't think this is going to work, you know, I, I don't think I can do this, you know. And uh, I said, this, this, this rehearsal thing is not working. She said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know, but I don't want to be in here, you know. So I, I, kinda, I, I, I went away and I came up with this bizarre notion. I thought, well, fuck it, I'm going to be homeless, so I'm going to go on the street, and I did. So wow. I, I was, um, I took, 27 pence, I remember, 27p, two fags. <laughs> and I went into London to uh, Waterloo, the Waterloo Arches as they were, they're probably gone now. Are they still there? I don't know. Um, and I thought, because I'd, I'd, I'd been past there a lot and I'd seen a lot of homeless there. And I thought, well, you know, this is where I'll, kind of, I'll make my, my home for a, a week and a bit. And uh, so I, I went into one of these arches, pulled back the tap hall, and I was like, smell. And it's just. Difficult, you know, and, and I, I sat in there, I lit one of the fags and I thought I was scared, you know, I was definitely scared. Finished the cigarette, very quietly lit the other one. I thought, was well, this, nobody comes in the time I've done this cigarette, I set them off. Halfway through, <sighs> tarpaulin bursts open and there's these two guys come in. I was looking and I was going, are you fucking doing in here? And there's a Glasgow accent. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I just gave this, gave this bullshit story for this guy about why I was, why I was there, you know, and he, he was, Jada, his name was, I always remember this guy, Jada. And he was the big matted dreadlock kind of hair, you know, there's a kilt as well, and oh. jeans on and stuff, this kind of kilt, it's, it's, it's a pathetic kind of sight really. And, uh, and his pal, his pal was just staring at me. <laughs> he was the dangerous one, you know, he was just kind of looking at me, then he said a word. Anyway, so after you know, 10, 15 minutes went by, he pulls out his pocket this bottle of milky looking liquid kind of thing. Goes like that. Gives it to me. <laughs> what the fuck is this, you know? <laughs> so if I don't take it, I'm in trouble, you know? So I thought, okay, I'm in trouble if I do, <laughs> trouble if I don't. So I took this, drank this, this stuff. I just felt my whole body going on fire, you know, oh, it was like, uh, it turned out in the end, I found it was meths and milk. It was meths and milk? No, wow. that, was, that was a tipple of choice. Uh, wow. you know. And um, I coughed my guts up, you know, and they started laughing and stuff. Ah, you're not out here, you're here, you're here. Anyway, so cut a long story short, I was there so for, for the week, the entire week. I spent a week with these guys you know, on the street. And... Um, uh, Antonia hadn't, she thought I was probably gone. So any, any, other, any other director or, or would have said, well, that this guy's away, <laughs> we'll replace this guy, cast someone else. Uh, but she, she accepted that, you know, she accepted that. She didn't, she wasn't even looking for me. I mean, I didn't, wasn't even in touch with my agent, and nothing. I was gone, I was lost in the street for this, this week, 10 days even. Um, and then I went back to uh, my friend's flat where, where I had been staying. And <laughs> Have you been? So I've been, I've been, you've been people calling you this stuff. So you've got, you've got. So eventually there was there was a there was um, schedule had arrived at this point kind of thing. And I got Antonia's number. And I said it's okay. I'll be back. And that's all I'd said kind of thing. She, she kind of said to everybody, it's all right. And I turned up. Um, I went to a, a hairdresser's and I turned to get with dreadlocks and stuff in my hair, stuff like that. And I kind of I went to a charity shop and got these. I dressed like Jada basically. I thought, well, that's that's who I'm going to be. And uh, I turned up um, eventually on, on the first night filming to do it as Jada, you know. And, uh, and the producer tried to get me taken off the set. He didn't know <laughs> I'm in this. I'm in this. It's okay. It's all right. You know. Um, so I, so through Antonia, through Antonia accepting that, and Antonia working with me on that, um, that that led to again me being here. You know, she was she was just wonderful, and she understood. She's so understanding. She loved actors. You know, she loved people. But she certainly loved that. She put your arm, arm around me so many times, you know. And then subsequently, since then, I worked with her in four other films. And uh, tragically, um, she, she passed away uh, about, God, I don't know. It seems like, you know, yesterday I was talking to her, but she, she passed away maybe about nearly 15 years ago now. She's very, very young. You know, she's in her 40s. She's had cancer. Uh, I miss her. You know, I still yeah. miss her. She was very, a great very woman. talented director. Great woman. A real loss. A real yes, loss. Yes, real loss indeed. Um, now... Irvin Welsh, of course, played a big part um, in your career as well. Yep. And um, you started working with his words in theatre, first of all. I did. Um, so t kind of tell us about that and then, and then how that then came to introduce you to the film in a way. Um, well, Train Spotting, the, the book, uh, it came out and it was, it, was, it was such a big, big deal, you know, it's, but it's particularly, I'm, some, I'm, I'm sure over here as well, mm. but it was a, a big, big deal in, uh, in Scotland, you know, in Edinburgh and in Glasgow. And at that time, I, was, um, I, had, I had my own theatre company at that time, myself and um, four other actors had uh, set up, we did this thing that all, all actors talk about, is like setting up your own company, we did it. And uh, I, I was directing at that time. That's really kind of what I was planning to be, really, yeah. at that time in my life. Um, anyway, so we, this, this book, we thought, this is great. We used to devise stuff. We would just devise and improvise things. So we would just give it a title, like drugs, or like prostitution, or whatever it was. And we would improvise around about these, this subject matter. So we thought, let's steal some of this. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> book. So I did, uh, and uh, kind of plagiarised um, a lot. Of train spot and, and, uh, and our, our work with Rain Dog Theatre Company, it was called. Um, so, uh, fr from that, so I knew it very, very well. And uh, this, uh, in terms of how I got involved with the film, um, D Danny at that time, I think Danny was going out with a casting director called Gail Stevens. And Gail Stevens had, um, through, again, through, um, 
Riff Raff and all these kind of and the Antonio Bird stuff, she had sort of got in touch with me for a, a piece called Cracker, which was, you know, well, oh, is there a murmur there? So, you, know, <laughs> you know what that's. Um, that was, that was a big, big deal, you know, and the, the first series of Cracker was so, so immensely brilliant. Every actor and their dog wanted to be in the, the second series, and I was no different. And uh, I was lucky enough to, to, to Gail Stevens, and she, 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 used to come, she used to, brilliant cast director, she'd go to the theatre, mm. she'd spot people and stuff like that, and she knew me, and she came to see Rain Dog stuff. So she, she, put, she uh, got me involved in, in Cracker and uh, I, I got the job obviously and played that part. So through that, Danny was, was, was um, suddenly in my life. But Danny, he did another film before Transport called Shallow Grave. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't in it, so you don't need to talk. <laughs> um, anyway, I was up for it. I was up for it, uh, and, uh, and there was, it was like, you know, there was loads of us up for it, and it whittled down and whittled down and whittled down, until eventually there was only two of us up for it. It was me and this guy called McGregor. He never went anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I, I, I went to see Danny. Uh, I thought, you know, he's so precise, Danny. You know, it was the fourth time or something I'd saw him reading this, this, this script, reading this, this piece for a script. And... Um, I went to, to, to see him again and he'd be in this hotel in Glasgow and he, he, he said, I'd read it, he says, great, he said, um, do you think you could do a, a bit more kind of middle class kind of thing, you know? I was like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, this is that brilliance, Danny, he, says, well, he said, no, you can't or no, you won't. Mm. a great question, you know? Mm. And I went, I, I won't, you know, I won't, he said, right. And, uh, very simple, but lots of long conversation, and he was great. He said, "Look, he said, well, I said, I think we just need to dis agree to disagree in this case." He said, "But, but thanks for, for coming in." And I thought, oh, I've just fucking talked myself out of my job. <laughs> the fucking door hit my ass and I went out the door. <laughs> <laughs> I was gone, so I thought, oh, that was, I can't believe it. I remember going to tell my wife. She was like, what "Are you fucking insane? Why did you do that?" I, said, I don't know why I did that, and I still don't know to this day why I did it. But anyway, um, anyway, so that was it. I left it like that, and uh, then uh, 18 months later, whatever it was, Danny's doing Trainspot, and then I get a call from the agent, and Danny Boyle wants to see you for, for Trainspot, and I thought, what is this? You know, is this just some kind of game this guy's going to play with me now, you know? He's going to toy with me like a cat with a mouse. And... Um, Oh, and I, I'd actually said to, to, to my wife, I said, I don't think I'm going to bother even going to wow. see him. I was genuinely, I said, I just don't think there's any point in this. You know, we had a kind of funny meeting the last time. I just don't know why he's doing this, why he want, would want to work with me. But anyway, eventually, you know, I kind of uh, went, obviously, um, to, to see him. And uh, the first time this had ever happened to me, it was the beginning of everything. From, everything from, from that point to now, um, things kind of became like this. Because I, 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 was, I was actually in, sitting down in the chair and he said, right, Ewan's playing Renton, would you want to play? Wow. What? Can you believe it? Not, that was the first time that had ever happened to me. And uh, I said, I don't know, I don't know, because at that time, age-wise as well, renting was probably the thing that I, was, I would have done, you know. Um, I said, I really, I really don't know, and I, and I said, well, you know, sick boy, maybe, you know, I suppose, you know. And Danny said, well, what about Begbie? And I was like, no, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Um, <laughs> why not? I said, because he's a monster, he's a big monster, he's a big monstrous beast of a guy, I'm not. You know, and this is done. I wish I could steal this, uh, claim this line, but it wasn't me. And he said, nah, he said, small cycles are the best. <laughs> uh, and I did it. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a question here from Derek who says, did you find it difficult to get into the character of Begbie in Trainspot? And he was very intense and intimidating character and very different to the other films you have worked on. So, I mean, was this a character who you knew in a way or... I'd met loads of Bigbies, I suppose, you know, growing up, Bigby types. But the thing about, about Bigby is, uh, is that, you know, I've, I've often said this as well, that he's not really, it's certainly the first film, you know, he's certainly not, he's not real. He's not really meant to be real. The whole of train spotting is very heightened, you know, and it's a kind of very heightened kind of look, a kind of drug addiction and all the rest of the things that go along with the film. So it wasn't really 
I wasn't trying to, I wasn't basing them on any, anyone. I wasn't thinking about anyone in particular. And uh, I mean, the, the, the other part of the question is no, it's, it's not, it wasn't difficult to, to do because it's, it's such, I just seen him as so big. As I said, the first story I told you, he's such a big, everything's big about Begbie. Everything, I mean, he walks, talks, everything's big. I thought, well, that's, that, and I'm not like that. I'm, I'm the opposite of that, really, you know. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to dive into this bigness of, of this, this character. And I've, I loved it. I love playing Bigby, you know, and I, I love playing him again, you know, and then 20 years later. Yeah. He's uh, such a, a great, great character to play. Well, Crazy. it's an extraordinary performance, and we loved it the first time, and we loved it the second time. <laughs> Transporting two. And uh, the. There were so many questions about the Blade Artist, uh, so many questions about uh, like other Begbie kind of possibilities, and is that going to be turned into a film, and would you do it? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yes, yes, and yes, uh, I would, I would definitely, definitely do it. Um, it's it's hard because uh, the, the Blade Artist uh, is the book, uh, Irvin's book, is 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 I, I love it. I think it's it's, it's it's his strongest narrative. I think yeah. in, in all of his books, but he, he's so uh, it's it's nuts. It's just mental, you know. And trying to get finance for that is, is quite difficult, you know. Mm. And um, I would really want to do it with Danny, you know, if we were going to do it. We spoke about it. And um, Danny's kind of kind of up for it, but I think Danny's point of view about it is that he. He's in love with all of us, you know, all these characters, whether it's Bigby Renton, Spud Sick Boy, all of them, that he doesn't really want to kind of isolate one, you know. So it might be a while. Also, the thing is that he's uh, Bigby's older and, and Blade Artist. He's uh, in his 60s. I'm not far away from that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just the same way as, as Danny did for, uh, for, for, for Transporting 2, he never wanted to make that until we were pretty much the right age, mm. you know. I remember talking to him years ago, saying, well, we could put on makeup, we could do it. He says, you can, of course you can put makeup on, but you, can't, you don't have that life experience, you don't have that thing. And uh, he's right. So I would think if, if Blade Artist is going to happen, it's probably going to be a good five years down the line. Well, we're going to look forward to it. <laughs> five years time, okay, 2024. Let's look forward to it. Um, now, you had extraordinary success at, at that time, train spotting, full Monty, etc. And there's a question here from Matt who says, was it a big culture shock from you to go, quite frankly, from starring in low budget British films such as Riff Raff, Full Monty, etc., to, to a big Hollywood production like The World Is Not Enough, 007? And how did you handle that kind of big move up into that big film? Um, well, you know, it's, it's a, a real, it was a privilege, you know, to be involved in it, really, you know, and to be involved in that franchise. Um, there was so much, I mean, I could, I could, I could bore you all night with, with stuff about James Bond. There was just things that happened that just, just take your breath away, you know, and the, one of the nice things, a nice little story, I think, is with the, my very first day, you know, when I, on it, I was filming in Pinewood on the, on the 007 stage, which is like, Hamden Park, massive yeah. place, and uh, it's so big. In fact, the, the, there's a little guy on the door <laughs> of, of this stage, and um, his, his radio was on. You know, it's so big he can play the radio, and you don't hear it all the way down there. <laughs> and uh, it was that. That's if you remember, there's a Robbie Williams song, Millennium. Yeah. And 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 uh, and, and that that song, there's um, the James the James Barry theme. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Plays in that. Yeah. That was you only lived twice. Just as I was yeah. going out the door, and at that stage, that theme was wow. playing. So I, was like, I can still feel it, and I was like, "Oh my god!" I looked at the wee guy, and I was like, "Yeah, that is." <laughs> 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 Gone, it's well because it was a big deal for me. You know, Sean Connery was, you know, Sean he Connery, was yeah. he was huge. You know, he was he was the only guy who kind of spoke a little bit like me <laughs> on film in the sixties. So it'd be, you know, that was a fantastic thing for me. Yeah. Um, well, uh, our second clip here is uh, there's a clip of you playing Reynard in uh, The World Is Not Enough, and then we're going to follow that up with you in Summer, which I know is screening tomorrow night. We're going to talk about so. Let's have a look at um, The World Is Not Enough and then Summer. Thank you.
we, we have a question here from Jackie who says, I've recently watched somewhere a movie you felt showcased your best performance. Did you identify with the character Sean as an adolescent and as an adult? It was deeply moving and a very real portrayal of a family struggling in many ways. Well, that's very kind of you to say that. It's nice. Um, I don't think it's, it's, it's about identifying necessarily. I think a, a lot of the times you, you get asked that as an actor, you know, that you think, oh, did, you, did you identify with this or did you feel this or did you feel that? I think it's really just, a, you know, I, th I really like Summer because at that time, that was maybe about 12 years ago now perhaps, yeah. um, I really felt that I kind of, it was a departure for me uh, as an actor because you, <sighs> You know, when I, when I was really young, a really young actor, I was just trying to be Robert De Niro all the time. You know, and you just try to be somebody else. You know, you sort of someone that you'd seen, or, or, a, or an actor that you'd seen, you try to be like them. You know, and uh, you sort of impersonating. You're almost impersonating uh, being an actor, and it, it takes a long, 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 long time to get rid of that. A long time to get rid of that, and to, and to actually be close to what is yourself. You know, you're not projecting yourself. But there's, there's, in order to get the kind of truth of the reality, you, you've, you've kind of got to touch that, scratch that little bit of your own heart sometimes, mm. you know. And with Summer, there was an opportunity kind of to do that and to be... Um, the character is almost me and just in a slightly different road, you know. And, and, and really since then, I, I think that I've managed to kind of do that. That Summer, and, and another couple of films around about that time in actual fact, I know you know was another one at the same time. Um, it's about feeling rather than, than than actors. You know, when you're younger, if you've got to feel emotion, then you you, you, you go to the well. You know, you think these terrible things that have happened to you in your life. You know, and then you kind of put that into your performance, and you cry and you do other stuff. No, it's bollocks, really. Yeah. <laughs> You know, all you're doing is uh, you're masking the reality, any kind of reality there. You get no chance. And and and, and we we summer. And as I say, the films are on about that time. For the first time, I was kind of able to feel the character's pain, to truly feel that character's pain, and it, and, and and almost not be that person, but to 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 live inside somebody else's head. And, and summer is, uh, is is for me is the, is the best example of me. I think achieving that, you know, of all my films, I think. Um, um, were you frustrated, say, working on a film like Summer and you put your heart and soul into it, as you say, and then when the film is released, it maybe doesn't get the biggest kind of exhibition? Yeah. And, and, and what was your kind of feeling about that, you know, when, when that happens? You know, you kind of half expect it as well, you know, there's, there's, there's never going to be a cure in the block to watch a film like Summer. And not a lot of these films that, that I've done, you know, like, maybe it's me. <laughs> uh, but a lot of these films that I've done, they're, they're not really, um, they're, not, they're not packed out houses, you know, to, to see these films, whether it's Ken Loach film or whether it's, you know, um, Pierce Elliott film or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you know, or, 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 or this with Kenny Glenan. You're not going to get a big audience for that, but you kind of have to kind of put that out of your mind and, and you, you, you don't, you're not doing it for an audience, you know. Strange thing, you're never ever doing it. You know, when you're on the set, when you're performing, you know, when you're, 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 you're being, you know, that, that guy, you're not thinking about this, you know, you're not thinking about that. You're, you're just existing within that, that place, you know, it exists within that place. It doesn't exist within this place. So it doesn't really bother me because it is to be expected, but it's, it is sad, you know, mm -hmm. it is sad. And it's especially something like that, but almost in a way, Summer's like a wee secret of mine, you know, it's like my wee thing. <laughs> I know what it is, you know, and, and now you know what it is. <laughs> but I know what it is, I know what it is to me, you know. And it, of course it would be nice if more people could say that, of course, of course. But it's not, it's certainly not what you're looking for when you do it. Well, we've got good news. Because uh, Summer screens tomorrow night as part of the Belfast Film Festival at QFT. There are some tickets left, and Robert will be introducing the film. So, the secret is out. The secret is I think out. Also, uh, I was talking to Mark. Where's Mark? Talking to Mark about this. Um, Ellie, we can, uh, after the film, I'll, I'll do a wee 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes. Brilliant. Q&A. Well, listen, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And
please try and come along. Please try and come along. Um, now, there are some questions that I should ask you here from the audience. Um, a couple of key questions. One from Jack, who says, where is the most beautiful place in Scotland? <laughs> My back garden. <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, Max wants to know, every actor's nightmare, have you ever been recognised in a public toilet and been asked for a selfie? <laughs> if so, how do you react? Not a selfie, because it was maybe a wee bit before that, but I swear to God, this happened. I swear to God, I swear to God. As you do. <laughs> this guy, this guy comes in, it was this, I remember he was on that side of me, so he's in one. <laughs> he goes like that. <laughs> Horrible. Horrible. Maybe not at the moment, you know. Maybe not at the moment, yeah. It does happen. Uh, Francisca wanted to know, is there a role you auditioned for but didn't get or declined and regret thanks? <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> this, this, thanks. Um, was there anything that, you, I mean, apart from Shallow Grave, you, that, Shallow that, Grave that, yes. you, that you spoke about, but is there, is, was there any other roles? Um, uh, no, not really. Um, there's things I've turned down, you know what I mean? But you, yeah. you don't really want to talk about it too much because, you know, that's somebody else's job and it's somebody yeah. else's yeah. life and career and stuff like that. But there's, there's, a, there's, there's a few things that I've turned down that, that people have, have done have went off to become, you know, very well known. So um, there is... The one, I, I, one I, I will talk about because it's sufficiently long enough <laughs> in the past, but I wish I'd kind of done it because I liked the show. It was a TV thing called Life on Mars. Oh yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was there. That was an offer, and I was I was kind of thinking about it back and forward, you know, about this, and um, until eventually, you know, they they were great. They said, well, you can play either of these parts. So I I, I was I, I got in touch with my pal Ray Ray Winston, you know, and I said, well, do you fancy this, you know? So he was looking at it, and we were both going to do it, and um, I, I can't really remember what happened. Genuinely, can't remember what happened to kind of knock that one in the head. But I kind of I turned it down in the end. I kind of regretted that because I thought it was a really good, a good thing, an interesting thing. Yeah, it was a great show. If you remember, it, it was a cop show where they time travelled back to the 1970s. Yeah, yeah. it was and like it was, the Sweeney yeah. part of it. That's what I liked about it. Either. You and Ray Winston, wow, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> Life on Mars. Um, now, um, you decided then, uh, we're kind of jumping forward a little, um, but you decided then to direct a film. Uh, uh, your first feature, Barney Thompson. Um, so, <laughs> tell us about that challenge. I mean, you had so many, like you had so much experience. You worked with a lot of directors, but what, what was? Why did you want to take that on? Uh, Barney Thompson it was a strange one because it, it, it came to me just as an actor, a um, long time before I, I directed it. And uh, I, I didn't fancy it, you know, I said, it turned, had turned it down. And it kept coming back, it kept coming back. It's like uh, his own life, this thing. You know, like, and um, I swear to God, it must have came about maybe five or six times. I remember saying to my agent at the time, look, don't, don't, don't send that, don't send this Barney Thompson thing, you know. And it was coming from all different, he wasn't even sending it, other people were sending it. It's a fucking thing, but um, anyway, so I I'd got rid of it and I was over in Vancouver by this point, uh, it was point time. And uh, there was a Canadian uh, producer friend of mine there, and he said, you know, there's a script, he says, a Scottish thing, he might be interested in it. I said, sure, I'll read it, you know. And he turned up the next day, he was fucking Barney Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> this thing's following me around, you know. <laughs> so I said, look, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not for me, because it's, it's Glasgow, but it's not Glasgow that I recognise. There was something just lacking and it missing in it, you know. And uh, he said, well, that's maybe because it was written by a Canadian. Ah, I understand now, you know, it's, 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 it's not right. Um, I said, well, look, if, if I was going to do it, I'd need to take, I've got a, a writing good friend, Colin McLaren, is my writing, writing partner now, and uh, I said, I need to give it to Colin, and he can you know, maybe do a draft on it. And so the guy eventually, terrible, I can't remember his name, but he, he was great, he just, because he, he, he didn't know, had no luck with this thing, you know, and he said, take it, you know. So then I went with, with Colin, and at the time I was only thinking about, you know, as being Barney, um, and trying to kind of get that, that right. 
And so as it went further down the line, it looked as though we were getting money was starting to come in with this thing, and, uh, but there was no director uh, attached to it. Mm -hmm. So again, it was the producer said, well, why don't you direct us? It's insane, you know, to, to, to be in it and direct it. You know, I never thought it could, wouldn't be possible to do that. Um, but I, I'd, I'd sort of lived with Barney for so long that I kind of knew him that I thought, well, you know, maybe I can do this because I don't have to spend on, uh, too much time on the characterization. This time I can maybe just do that. So the way that I, I kind of done it was, was, I suppose, interesting. That a, a friend of mine, the uh, son, was a good young actor, Mark, and uh, I said, I went to Mark and I said, look, do you want to come and be my, kind of my stand-in in this? But, you know, it's going to be more than that, you know, so I don't want you just to, to, I want you to learn it, actually become Barney, you know, another Barney, because I'm not going to be able to kind of do an awful lot of rehearsals, so going to, need to set up the shots and do this kind of stuff. So Mark did this, Mark came in and he became Barney, so it, Ray Winston and Emma Thompson, these people, they didn't feel as if they weren't um, getting rehearsal, they weren't getting time, they were getting actually more but it was, and Mark was great. So the, he, he, was, he, was, he, he was brilliant. He was, he was an impersonation of me he was doing, which was fantastic. Um, so he, he did that and I kind of sat outside and kind of set, set these shots up and was able to kind of get through it because of that. But you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of it. You know, I think it was, it, was, it, was, it was a good thing. We shot it in 30 days, less than 30 days, something like that. Um, I remember one, one, one particular Friday, the, the 36 setups on the Friday, wow. which is uh, bizarre. That's a lot, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> 36 setups is a lot. And they managed to kind of get through, get through the, the, the piece. Uh, it's very dark, very funny, and uh, you've got a great cast in it. As you say, you had Ray Winston, Tom Courtney, and Emma Thompson mm. playing your mother. I mean, it's an extraordinary uh, kind of performance. And, no one would ever have seen her in that role. Uh, and, uh, but how did you see that? What, what, what did you see in her? Well, um, she, she's such a brave actress, Emma Thompson. You know, I, I think I needed someone very brave to, to, to do this, this part because it's, you know, there's not many, because she's supposed to be in her late 70s, this, this character. And there's not many act actresses out there at that age that, that, are, that that will do it or capable of doing that, you know? So I kind of scoured and scoured around and I thought, he's somebody who was Scottish, hopefully, but that was getting more and more difficult. And I remember them doing a, a piece called Tutti Frutti. It was years and years ago, a TV piece called Personal Quality. <laughs> um, Tutti Frutti. So, and she was, I thought, she, I, the first time I'd seen her was that, and I thought she was Scottish, which is, you know, for Scots to say that, that's a big thing. Um, so I kind of thought, well, she can do it, she can do the accent. So, and also, this is a nice week in a sideline from um, At the time, Phil Monty um, was, was around. Uh, I got a, a, a postcard uh, from an agent from, from Emma Thompson. I'd never met her before. And Emma, she's a fantastic artist, Emma, brilliant artist. And uh, this, this beautiful card, sort of hand-drawn card came through. And it was lovely. She's just saying, look, we've never met, but you know, I'm just so proud of you. And, it's such a beautiful thing, you know, it's just like an unsolicited sort of thing. And I, 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 I've still got that card mm. to this very day. And of course, at the time, you know, I was like, well, I'm going to get back in touch with it, I'm going to say something, but I never ever did, you know, because I was doing something else or whatever, and it went to the back of my mind, and then suddenly you forget. And, I, and, I, and at that, I thought, oh, fuck, you know, this is maybe the end here, you know? <laughs> and um, so when I, when I, I sent her, I sent her the, the script and I, I wrote this, this, this letter to her and I, I, was, I spoke about that, that how I'd, I'd never forgotten that, that kindness, you know. Um, and please have a look at this, this bizarre thing, you know, you, you're going to be my 80-year-old mother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, two days later she accepted, you know, she said yes. Yeah, so. uh, well, our final clip is going to be Emma Thompson, if you haven't seen this, it's extraordinary. <laughs> in Barney Thompson opposite Robert and then we're going to see you as Rumpelstiltskin in Once Upon a Time. Um, well, let's talk about TV drama and film, uh, Robert. I mean, you've always worked in both, uh, you know, as we said, right from the beginning with Cracker, Hamish Macbeth, etc. I mean, what, I mean, did, did you have any sense of any difference between them or how has that changed over the years? I think it's definitely changed. I think way, way back when I was first, you know, coming out of drama school, you know, all those years ago, it really was that, you know, if, if you did film, you, you shouldn't do TV. That was the thing, you know, if you did TV, you, could, you weren't going to do film. 
Um, but, uh, but of course, that, that, that's changed and, and completely, you know, and totally now that things have, you know, the, the, the world, the, the way people kind of view entertainment, you know, or the way they want to be entertained has, has, has changed entirely. You know, the, the way that people watch it, they watch bundles, they watch box sets. You know, there's, 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 there's Netflix, there's, you know, Amazon, there's Hulu, there's everything, all this stuff. There's, there's masses of product, you know, at your disposal now. So there isn't really an awful lot of difference anymore, I don't think, between uh, people at home watching a, a film or watching, you know, a, 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 t, a, a TV piece. Breaking Bad was just, you know, a brilliant kind of, kind of piece. I was just watching something recently that kind of passed, passed me by. It's called Quarry. You know, if you've never seen it, but check it out. You know, certainly the first episodes of that, first four episodes of that. They only did eight of them, but um, it's it's absolutely brilliant. You know, and it's it's as good as any film you're going to see. You know, so so to me, there is there is no difference. You know, that that kind of that that um, strange kind of <laughs> TV versus film world. This kind of it's mer all merged together. Now, of course, there are certain films. You know, people, you know especially a younger audience, they want to go and see Infinity Wars and they want to go and see this sort of stuff and big, big, big budget stuff. That's, that's always going to be a big, big deal. And that's, these event pieces, you know, are always going to be. Um, but, uh, but, I think, but, but I think film itself, or the kind of films that I like, I think you, you, can, you can get that kind of quality in the TV medium as well. No, you don't necessarily have to be in film. So when the character of Rubble Stilston came up in Once Upon a Time, did, yeah. uh, you know, because this ended up being seven seasons, is yep. that right? And it was a big commitment for you to, yeah. you know, to go to Vancouver. But what, what was that experience like working there and, kind of, and, and, and actually living there? Look, it was brilliant. It was fantastic. You know, I'm a lucky man to, to be in a, a, such a beautiful part of the world, you know. It's a fantastic city to be in. And um, also, you know, for, 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 for opportunity for my children. To, to go there. When I went out there, my, my youngest was uh, three, you know, and um, he's now 13, you know, and, and we're, we're still out there, you know. So they've grown up there, they've went to school there, and uh, they have a kind of, uh, they've had a different kind of, you know, life, for, certainly from the one that I had when I was growing up, and I'm, I'm happy for that, you know, and it's, uh, they, they, they're they enjoying it. It's, it's kind of difficult because we think, oh, what are we going to do now? <laughs> this show finished, uh, run about this time last year. Matter of fact, exactly this time last year, Colin, exactly this time last year, it finished. Um, and we were ready, we were packed up, ready to go. And um, uh, my wife and I, we could see that uh, the kids were a bit kind of like that, you know. We thought, Ask them, you know, what, 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 what do they want to do? And we said, well, what do you just want to do? We want to stay. They said, <laughs> why did I say that? <laughs> you know? um, so we're, kind of, we're, we're there for a bit, you know, and uh, let them kind of maybe finish their school there. So who knows, you know, it's just that it's all work related and work dependent, so we shall see. But it was a, a fantastic experience, loved it. Met some great people, this guy, you know, it was brilliant. Um, made some great some friendships during that time, which will, which will, which will continue. Um, and I loved it. I loved playing Rumpel. Great, great part to play. And did you find a whole new audience playing that character of Rumpel Stiltskin? And, yes. and, and how did that differ from the, from the kind of other fans who might have approached you before that? Um, it, it, was, it was entirely different, of course. Uh, I don't think... Certainly over there in America, because of most of these films that, I, that I've done are like low-budget stuff, you know, independent stuff, they don't really travel, you know, and they don't really travel to, to the States. Um, so people knew me this much maybe over there, but, but when Rumpelstiltskin appeared and Once Upon a Time appeared, suddenly that, that, that grew, you know, and suddenly youngsters, you know, like people... You know that were watching that show like 13, 14 year old, and then they, they stuck with the show, and they're now 20 in their 20s now. That they they suddenly dis discovered me, and um, and what was interesting about that is, is they started to then through things like like, like social media and stuff and tell me, oh, I've seen Riff Raff, or, or I've seen Summer, or, and you go, that's brilliant. That you know, what brilliant. a great thing that this, there's a whole a whole new audience that kind of were um, introduced to. These um, these little films. That <laughs> and now you're working on something at the moment. Uh, yes. So can you t can you talk about that? Can you he tell laughed. us about can he you laughed. tell us about the part that you're playing? This is all good news for us, by the way. Tell us about who you're playing. Ah uh, yes. Uh, oh, this thing is called Cobra, and it's set uh, it's set about 10, 12 years in the future, and uh, I am playing the Prime Minister. Yeah. The Prime Minister. We need a Prime Minister. Which is kind of odd, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Tory, though, so... 
<laughs> it's strange. It's very, very strange playing the Prime Minister. And also, uh, it's very, doubly strange because of this mad Ukrainian guy. At the moment, if you're aware, yeah. in politics, there was this yeah. kind of mad Ukrainian actor who was playing the Ukrainian president on yeah. TV <laughs> is now running for, for the Ukrainian presidency. So people are saying to me, do you want to take over for Theresa May? <laughs> <laughs> nah, you're all right. That's the last thing that anybody would want to do, that job. <laughs> no, maybe not. <laughs> uh, well, Robert, you know, you've come here over the years and, you know, what has been amazing has been the transformation in this place, in this city. And as you know, the TV and film industry here is booming at yeah. the moment. There's amazing things being made here. Um, what we would love to see is you back here working in this city. Do you think that may be possible in the future? I would hope so. I would certainly hope so. As, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, uh, there's not a lot of difference between the, you know, the two, the two cities, Glasgow and, and, and Belfast, or certainly Ireland. You know, all of Ireland and, and Scotland are kind of so linked. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to. You know, it's, uh, sadly, it's not up to me. <laughs> if it was up to me, I, I'd be doing that. Of course, I do have. Um, there's directing projects that I have as well, which are kind yes. of on the go at the moment. So. I might, there might be, there might be something here, there might well be. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, we would love to see that, wouldn't we? We would love to see that. We would love to see that. Um, now, we're coming towards the end of our time, but we're going to allow members of the audience here, if anyone is brave enough, loud enough, who would like to ask anything, they can raise their hands, and we would love to hear from you. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to use in the moment, but if there's anybody at the back here before we move down to the front, is there anybody? Yes. Speak nice and loud if you can. Um, first of all, I'm a huge fan. Thank huge, you. huge fan. Uh, I just want, I mean, if it's possible, can you do the rumple? <laughs> <laughs> No, I never do that. I'd never do ever do that or any lines from films and stuff like that because no. that's what that is. That's yeah. again, I was talking earlier about that exists in that place, doesn't really exist in this place. So, but thank you for asking. <laughs> yes. Music over the years. Music, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I do. I play a lot of music, very loudly at my trailer. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, at, at, the, at the moment, actually, at the moment, strangely enough, I don't know why, but it's, I don't know why at the moment. It's Lloyd Cole and the Commotions for some reason. I've been playing a lot of that. So, so, I don't know, just keep me back to that. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why. It's just something that kind of like moves you. Also, at the moment, um, there's there's a, a thing, uh, and I'm a composer. He's a, he's mostly he does a lot of film scores now. It's called Ludovico Iannaudi. Oh yeah. And uh, I'm kind of listening to that as yeah. well, and that kind of suits the whole kind of political kind of world. I think so. Yeah. So thank you for saying that. I do. I do listen to a lot of music. Now, do we have something from over here? Yes. Yeah. Um, you also have director projects that you were talking about. You also said you'd like to come here. Mm. So would there be any theatre projects that you would think that you could bring here, maybe direct or star in? And are there any roles that you'd love to play? Um. It's difficult, you know, the, 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 the acting, you know, in the theatre because it's. Um, it's such a kind of long commitment, you know what I mean, that you, you have to do, and there's, there's a lot of other things that are kind of, a lot of responsibilities. And it's much easier when you're younger, for sure, you know. I very nearly went back into the theatre last year, in fact. I was offered a play uh, in the West End in London, and I was really, really close to, to doing it. And I'd actually said, yes, I was going to do it, and then I kind of backed out of it in the end. Um, so it's, it's always kind of been in, in my mind, in the back of my mind to do it, because it is my first love, there's no doubt, you know, and, and I've enjoyed it. I, I don't know, I mean, God, it's been... 25 years since I've been on a stage, so I don't know, I don't really know how I would be able to cope with it. You know, I could do it one night, 
<laughs> yeah, it's no. every night. It's yeah. <laughs> Ninety nights. <laughs> that's that's something else entirely. And of course, it's a you've got to love it, you know. And uh, I mean, the actors that, that do that, you know, night in, night out, you know, you've really got to love that. Got to love that, you know. So um, I, I've I've still to find that that thing that I love so far. <laughs> Thank you. Now, do we have anything over here? Yes, sir. Nice and loud, if you can. What's the Best piece of direction you've ever received. Wow. Um, the, the, ah, uh, yes. There's, um, this is a, uh, well, funny because it was in Ireland as well. Alan Parker, uh, Angela's Ashes. Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, there's this shot, it was really just a shot. It was like you know, a one eighth page scene, it was nothing. Um, it's a, it really st it starts on water in the, in the, the, the gutter kind of thing. Uh, yeah. And it's, as, as the, the camera kind of follows this water and it goes, finds me standing against a, a doorway and I'm, I'm a cigarette, finished the cigarette and I go in and, and inside my, one of the kids is dying, I think, up there in the, the, uh, in the actual scene. And um, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I love, I love, I mean, most actors do, we love shots where we're not talking. It's <laughs> you don't need to learn it. And uh, anyway, so the, the camera was kind of moving along and stuff like that and comes up like that and I can see it. And I'm like, yeah, smoking. And then Alan Parker came up and he said, she said, right, you've got the fucking bath, I just get in the door. <laughs> <laughs> He was right, you know. He's right because you know, especially you're younger, younger actor. You can dwell on things far too, too much, you know. And you think, yeah, this is great. It's not great. It's just a moment. Do it, <laughs> you know. And that's uh, that was good advice. <laughs> right. Do we have a final question? It'd be great to have. So now, what's the best one? We gotta, we gotta have a really good final point here. Who do, who do you think has it? Okay, go ahead. Nice and loud, if you can. Hamish Macbeth is one of my favourite TV series ever. Hmm. Just wondering what the best and the worst thing was about filming it. Uh, the best thing about it was probably, you know, the, 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 the scenery that was there. It was a fantastic um, place to be. Also, I guess, I mean, most of these people that are in it, when, uh, when 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 Hamish first came up, uh, I was I was right in at the, the, the heart of it, you know. So the, the the casting people were asking me who who do you think? And I had I had been directing my, my theatre company as I spoke about earlier on. Um, I'd been directing for for many years before that. So we had an ensemble with Rain Dog. There was about twenty of us that came and went. So every single person, I think just about every single.